Greetings. Uh, this is Peg Brady. I'm at NOAA Fisheries uh, here in Silver Spring, Maryland. Welcome to the EBM, EBFM se monthly seminar series. Uh, we Our series this month uh, kicks off with a uh, talk by uh, Jamil Samori, and we also have another a speaker who will be initiating the presentation, Aaron Ramajan. Uh, they are presenting from their home in California and I'd like to welcome them. The title of their talk is Co-Development of Ecosystem-Based Risk Assessment for California Fisheries by Scientists, Stakeholders, and Managers. So, Aaron, we're going to turn the presentation over to you now, and uh, I believe you're kicking off the beginning of the presentation, and then we'll turn it over to Jamil. Uh, there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, you can either submit questions uh, here in the room. Uh, we're in the NOAA Library here in Silver Spring or you may uh, do so online and we'll field the questions uh, to Jamil and Aaron. Um, if they are detailed questions, we'll recommend that you possibly uh, email uh, Aaron and Jamil. Their addresses will be at the end of the presentation. So if there's a more detailed uh, question you have and you'd like to follow up with our speakers today, uh, you may do so that way. So again, uh, thanks again both to Jamil and Aaron and welcome to everyone who's joining today online and those here in the library at NOAA Fisheries. Thanks. Um, I will introduce myself first, which is funny because um, Jamil has actually introduced and uh, invited me to, to present with him today. Um, I'm Erin Ramanajam. Um, excited to be here and honored to share some of this work with you. Um, when I conducted this work, I was with California Ocean Science Trust, and I'm now with a company called Avalon Associates. Jamil, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Jamil Samhori. I'm at the Northwest Fishery Science Center in Seattle, which I think is a good bit colder than California today. It was in the 30s when I woke up this morning. Um, and I'm delighted to be presenting this, co-presenting this talk with Aaron because it really was a team effort. And uh, what we'd like to do is share a bit about how we developed a scalable ecosystem-based risk assessment with a team of scientists, stakeholders, and managers in California. And to some extent, the how we did this and how it came about is as or more interesting than the results of the risk assessment. And I personally learned a lot from it. So Aaron, if we could just go to the next slide. Uh, I'd love to get to the take home point for those of you with short attention spans slash if you're on the East Coast and it's almost time to go home. Um, if, you, if you take nothing else away from this talk, it's, it's these three lessons, I hope. The first is um, taking advantage of a policy window to align science that can best inform the policy that is being implemented or written is really a promising approach for getting ecosystem science used. And that involves a, a number of steps like figuring out what science is needed and developing a strategy to create it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that worked in the case of California today. The second lesson is uh, don't be a perfectionist. Uh, that the, the, the best answer isn't necessarily uh, the, the right one in the, in the sense that if it, if it comes too late, then it, it will be unlikely to be used and so some information generated in a transparent way is likely to be better than no scientific information at all and then the the last uh, lesson here for me was around engaging early and often to co-develop science with the people who will use it and are going to be impacted by it the most in order to increase its staying power and we'll elaborate a bit about that as we go on so I'm going to hand back to Aaron for a few slides, and then you'll hear from me again in a little bit. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to be sharing um, more about this first lesson that Jamil has for us about you see a policy window and you open it and get some help. Um, and ultimately, this is the story of how um, we found NOAA-generated tools and met uh, Jamil and Joe and got to work with them. Um, so, uh, as Jamil mentioned, um, and then made this really pretty slide for all of us to see, for a, a policy window to be open, three streams need to come together, policy, politics, and a problem. It's commonly thought of more in the context of a disaster, post-disaster, like 
the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and opportunities for restoration. But you need not have a disaster. Um, however, I was at a workshop earlier this week about coastal resiliency and planning for sea level rise. And folk were all uh, saying that they're trying to act now, but it might take a real disaster for there to kind of be the, the bigger policy change to enable some action. So food for thought. Um, in any case, and what we're here for today, in our neck of the woods here in California, the policy window is this wonderful uh, piece of legislation called the California Marine Life Management Act that was passed in 1999. It requires an ecosystem perspective, including the whole environment. So it calls for ecosystem-based management, and it requires a master plan that prioritizes fisheries according to the need for comprehensive management through fisheries management plans. Um, and again, in this, this policy window and timing, so what does this mean um, for us? So the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, embarked on a process to update their master plan, their MLMA master plan. And really this master plan um, in practice is the department telling everybody how they are going to implement the Marine Life Management Act. And this policy window was opened, um, not just because of the requirement in the MLMA, but the department needed to update their old master plan. It was almost 15 years old. It had old science, science is evolving rapidly. It had old prioritized lists of species. Um, and it required that every fishery be under a fisheries management plan. And the way that it was written in the old master plan was that these uh, FMPs required a lot of data. Um, and in California, we don't have um, very many fisheries that are, are data rich. It took a lot of process. Um, every fisheries management plan was taking years and millions of dollars. Um, and again, many fisheries in California are small scale, so they don't necessarily generate even the amount of money that was being spent to write a plan. Um, and so the department said, hey, they heard, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, we need to consider fisheries impacts to target species, ecosystem structure and function, socioeconomics and other factors, but we've got to find a better, faster way to do this. And they um, embarked on their own uh, amendment process. And um, this is a clip of, of, of kind of their process here. And the department said, there's gotta be a better way and we need help. Um, and that's what you see here in uh, phase one, kind of their information gathering phase that for them started in, in 2015. Um, and where we come into this is, um, there's a bullet point down there at the very bottom left about information gathering projects. And the work that we're talking about today started in late 2016, and we had about a year to complete this pilot project. Um, so it was a tall order. We had about a year to uh, integrate ecosystem considerations into decision making and foster transparency and flexibility and management for the department and its partners. Sorry, I keep forgetting that I have to advance my own slides. Um, so that is where the department stood but before you know how did the department get to the point in 2016 of reaching out and saying all right we want an era to help us think about ecosystems and think about how we prioritize fisheries and, and update our thinking on this um so before the master plan amendment process started so this this process that the state had to update update kind of their their paperwork. Um, the Ocean Protection Council, which is a state agency in California, um, had funded the California Ocean Science Trust to start looking at ERAs um, for use in California fisheries just more broadly in 2013. That's the report that you see off on the side. Um, while that was going on, we knew that the old master plan used uh, productivity susceptibility analysis to prioritize fisheries, which it, in my opinion sits in that class of ERA tools. Um, and those two things kind of together led the Ocean Protection Council to decide that as part of that information gathering process for the department, that it would be helpful for them to have a pilot project um, to look at 
ecological risk assessments to support prioritization of fisheries, and they funded this work in 2016. Um, our first step at Ocean Science Trust was to begin to investigate, interview, and present pros and cons of adapting different types of ERA frameworks to the state. We looked at CARE and CARE Lite uh, from EDF. We looked at E-Ray from Hob Day. Uh, we looked at qualitative consequence risk assessment analysis from Fletcher. Um, we looked at a whole suite of tools. Um, and we involved a lot of authors in those conversations to help us really understand the adaptability for California specific needs. And where we, we all landed um, was that the multi-stressor framework that Jamil and Phil Levin published in 2012 was the best starting point for us. We had a lot of criteria that we used um, to make this decision. But ultimately, it was really driven by um, the already established scientific rigor of the tool, um, the ability to address fisheries at the species level rapidly, and its ability to be customized to address bycatch and habitat, um, not just target species, and to take into account um, California's MPA network and find a way to integrate that into decision making. Um, and then once we made that decision, we we did the department reached out for help and we did the same thing and put together put together this team so we we worked really closely with the california department of fish and wildlife in the development of this tool all the way through so they were an integral part of this team um, we had the ocean science trust who was helping to really understand the management need and link that to science um, we had Noah, who uh, agreed once we decided we wanted to work with that tool, who agreed to help us adapt their tool and um, create something scientifically rigorous, create something that could use different types of knowledge. Um, and we knew that in order to deliver on the promise of something that was transparent, that we needed to include fishermen and NGOs and other stakeholders. And we reached out to our partners at Strategic Earth, who are wonderful communicators, and relationship builders and um, very good at, at helping us make key connections in that community and drawing folks into this process. Um, we really think that the shape of this team was critical to us working quickly to, to co-develop an analytical tool that the department could use to help reach it goal, its goals. Um, and lastly, before I turn this back over to Jamil, um, I think that this just kind of shows the different different steps and summarizes how we got to where we were going. This is in that re, um, this report down on the right. Um, I think it's just a good, good synopsis of, of what we did. Uh, at the beginning, like I said, we worked with the department to set their priority goals, which is that top line. We took those goals and translated them into priorities for an ERA, you know, that it has to be scientifically rigorous. Um, it needs to address habitat, bycatch, and target. We worked with um, expert scientists at NOAA um, to turn those priorities into a scientific question um, and then to adapt the ERA to answer that question. And we worked with a whole swath of partners and stakeholders and fishermen to design and implement that tool and deliver those results uh, to the department. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over, turn it over to Jamil. Thanks, Aaron. That was a great overview of how we got to end up working together. Uh, some of you in the audience might be wondering, what does that have to do with the National Marine Fisheries Service specifically? Was this just uh, in, important in a California context? And so just to address that quickly, and I think there could be a lot of discussion on this topic, there's a couple ways that I think this work is relevant in the context of the National Marine Fisheries Service mandates. Um, one in particular is thinking about this tech memo that Rick Mathot and colleagues published a few years ago about how the agency should go about prioritizing which fish stock assessments are done in which order. 
And in particular, I'll draw attention to this fourth leg of a stool for whether or not you're going to assess a stock and that's ecosystem importance. And to my understanding, that, uh, that component is not often addressed rigorously in the same way that say stock status or assessment information is in deciding which stocks are gonna get assessed this year versus wait another year or two. And so an ecological risk assessment could be used as one way to determine the ecosystem importance of a stock and a fishery, and then use that information to decide whether or not it ranks high as a priority for assessment this year. Perhaps more obviously, in the context of our ecosystem-based fisheries management policy and roadmap, there is a step about determining priorities based on vulnerabilities and risks of ecosystems and their components. And so ecological risk assessment is built in to the idea of implementing EBFM. And in particular, the idea is that it can be used to inform trade-offs around both within the fishery sector and with other sectors. And so in particular, trying to understand how fishing activities influence not just target species, but also those species that rely on fisheries targets as prey, that are caught as bycatch in a fishery, or are affected by a fishery because their habitat is a component of moving forward with ecosystem-based fisheries management. So, Hopefully that helps uh, you all see the policy window that was evident in California in particular for conducting this ecological risk assessment and uh, the timeline we had, which was just a year, and also gives a little bit of a backdrop for how we might look for similar windows of opportunity within a NOAA context. So I'm gonna move on to the, the second lesson from this effort, which is producing information that is co-developed and transparent on a timeline that suits the policy need. And so to get into the specifics of what we did, we considered this a pilot ecological risk assessment or ERA. We focused initially on five species, the California halibut, California spiny lobster, kelp bass, Pacific herring, and white sturgeon um, that are represented in nine different fisheries where a fishery is defined by the species, sector, and gear. So sector would be commercial or, or sport fishing. And then the gear type varies from hook and line to gill net to trawl. Uh, and then in the case of lobster, there are there's a hoop net and a trap fishery. So those are the, the nine fisheries that we focused on. We, in collaboration with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, identify 10 bycatch groups or guilds that we would focus on to determine their risk from each of these nine fisheries. You can see those groups listed here, but they varied from things like elasmobranchs and flatfish to uh, salmon and marine mammals. One thing that was important in thinking about this is uh, whether or not these bycatch groups were protected species, say under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or ESA, Native Species Act uh, in the sense that risk to protected species would elevate the need for addressing uh, risk from a particular fishery. We also assess the risk to 10 habitats caused by each of these fisheries. And you can see those habitats listed here, but they fall into hard and soft bottom habitat categories, living habitats, and then other, which were you know basically open ocean pelagic environments and estuaries. And then we divided things up according to, to depth for the hard and soft bottom habitats. So the idea was to determine the risk from each of these nine fisheries on, uh, on the target stocks themselves, along with these 10 bycatch groups and 10 habitats, and we had a year to do it. Um, I think I've already sort of laid this out, but in case it was a little unclear how you got from five target species to nine fisheries, that's sort of laid out in this slide here. You can see that there are four different fisheries for halibut, one sturgeon, two lobster, and then a kelp bass and a herring fishery. 
and many of you will be familiar with the, the general framework that we use to gain an ecosystem perspective on risk assessment. And so Aaron had mentioned product, productivity susceptibility analyses earlier, or PSAs, which are used as a uh, fast and efficient way of determining risk to target stocks, where stocks that have lower productivity out here on the x-axis and higher susceptibility up here on the y-axis are considered to be at higher risk, and then higher productivity stocks with lower susceptibility are lower risk. Another way of thinking about this is in terms of the exposure of an ecosystem component to a stressor or risk factor, and then it, its sensitivity if it is exposed. And again, the idea here is that things that are not as exposed and not as sensitive are at lower risk, highly exposed, highly sensitive things are at higher risk. And then in terms of taking action, one can imagine that things that are at the highest risk are the highest priority for intervention. In the case of California, intervention might look something like deciding to move forward with what they're calling enhanced status reports of a stock or to even develop a fisheries management plan. Things that are uh, highly exposed but not as sensitive might receive a lower intensity intervention and so forth. So uh, another way of saying this is that we were really standing on the shoulders of uh, giants and some, along with some previous work that I had been involved with in uh, developing a framework that would be tailored to the needs in California, but not, we were definitely not starting from scratch. And yes, uh, this is the chance to say, okay, so we only had a year, we're going to assess nine fisheries and 10 bycatch groups and 10 habitats. That's a lot to do. And so we did not uh, obtain data on each of those groups and for each of those fisheries. What we did is we worked with our partners at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to conduct an expert-based scoring assessment of the exposure and sensitivity of target and bycatch groups along with habitats. The, this gives you an idea of how we did the expert scoring. What we did is for target species, bycatch groups, and habitat groups, we developed a list of exposure attributes and sensitivity attributes. So things like MPA coverage, for those of you with, familiar with the California context, the development of MPA network has been a big deal over the last uh, decade, decade and a half. And so one thing that, that CDFW was particularly interested in was in giving credit for that kind of spatial management or closures. In other words, we wanted to make sure we represented whether MPAs were reducing the exposure of target stocks to fisheries or of bycatch or habitat groups, and in so doing, reducing risk. Um, uh, and then for sensitivity, you know, things that ha that are less fecund or produce fewer babies, um, and or uh, each year and uh, mature at later ages are expected to take longer to recover once perturbed from fishing and so they'd be considered more sensitive and we had similar categories of exposure and sensitivity for the bycatch groups and the habitat groups with some variation um, that i could get into if there are specific questions about it so uh, before i show some initial results the general idea then was to uh, at least two experts scored each of the exposure and sensitivity attributes for each of the target species in the nine fisheries, along with the 10 bycatch and 10 habitat groups in those fisheries, there were conversations that those experts had around how they arrived at those scores. We also included data quality ratings. Some of these scores were based on looking at quantitative information about the total amount of bycatch, for instance, in a fishery of a particular bycatch group. Uh, or even spatial overlays of the footprint of a fishery relative to the footprint of a habitat. And some of these were based on um, years of familiarity and experience with a fishery and its impacts on the ecosystem. And so that was information we had as well. So with that information in hand, we could then look at how those expert-based scores sorted out in a risk space. And so just to point out, in case you guys are wondering what the alphabet soup of acronyms is on the slides that follow. We have the commercial gill net, commercial hook and line, commercial trap, commercial trawl, sport poop net, and sport hook and line. And I'm going to be showing you panels for risk to target species, bycatch, and habitats. 
And so over here on the lower left, you can see the results for the risk to target species. In this case, uh, out here on the far right, we can see that white sturgeon sport hook and line fishery was considered to be the fishery that posed the greatest risk to the target species itself, whereas the her Pacific herring commercial gillnet fishery uh, was ex expected to be creating the least risk to the target fishery. <coughs> Excuse me. In that case of the herring fishery in particular, uh, offline conversations suggested that the, the greater concern was with uh, climate variability and its influences on herring in California in particular. So then if we, uh, you know, again, considering the same nine fisheries, but now look at the average risk to all 10 bycatch groups posed by each of the fisheries, we see something that for those of you familiar with, um, with gillnet fisheries and with halibut fisheries will not, not be in, entirely surprised by, we see that the California halibut, commercial gillnet and trawl fisheries pose the greatest rich risk to bycatch because by nature of the gear and how they're operated, they end up catching a number of other species along the way. What you can see here in the legend is not just that as you get to more deeply colored blue in the background, um, you're getting the greater risk, but also the size of each of these points in, reflects the number of protected species or bycatch groups that are interacting with uh, these fisheries. And so, for example, the trawl fishery interacts with two protected species groups, as does the kelp bass fishery. And then finally, if we look on the far right here at the risk to the 10 habitat groups, from each of these fisheries, we see that, again, the California halibut, trawl, and gillnet fisheries show up as those that are posing the greatest risk. Here's the trawl, commercial trawl, and here's the commercial gillnet fishery. And in this case, we've used the point size to reflect the number of habitat groups that interact with each of these fisheries. So for instance, Lobster fisheries occur in a number of different habitat types, whereas uh, something like the sturgeon fishery really only occurs in one of the habitat types we assessed. Hopefully one thing that jumps out to you in looking, uh, however briefly, at these three figures, which represent risk to the full ecosystem in the context of the California assessment, is that there's some consistency. In other words, the halibut commercial fisheries stand out as posing higher risk across all three of these ecosystem components. Whereas uh, as a counterexample, Pacific herring commercial gillnet fishery has relatively lower risk to all three ecosystem components. You can see that in this figure where on the left, we've got labels for each of the fisheries using the same alphabet soup of acronyms we did previously. And then uh, the risk to the, the relative risk score for target species and then bycatch and habitat are shown juxtaposed to one another. And basically down here, most of the bars are closer to the origin and up here, most of the bars are further from the origin, providing some level of an ecosystem perspective on the relative risk from these nine fisheries to uh, target bycatch and habitat groups. Another way to think about this, though, is in terms of the cumulative risk across the nine fisheries we assess to each of the bycatcher habitat groups. So that's what these little thermometers here are intended to represent, showing that, for example, for a group like elasmobranchs, three of the fisheries we assessed interact with elasmobranchs, basically catch, catch sharks uh, and raises bycatch, and uh, the expected risk is pretty low for each of those fisheries. Whereas if we look at um, something like um, the halibut fisheries influence on flatfish, the flatfish are bycatch in a number of different fisheries and the, the relative risk scores were pretty high. Um, you know, as a third example with salmon, they're really only caught as bycatch in the sturgeon sport hook and line fishery out of the nine fisheries we assessed. Of course, you might be thinking, well, there are not just nine fisheries in California, there's a whole lot more, and sh there sure are, and we will talk a little bit about where this is in terms of moving from pilot study uh, 
to uh, adoption and, and application across all of California's fisheries in a, in a little bit. Uh, again, this is the same idea of using these thermometers to take a habitat-centric perspective and say, okay, for the fisheries you've assessed, what are the kind of cumulative risks across those fisheries to these habitats? And so, for example, if we go over here to habitat forming marine vegetation, we can see that four of the nine fisheries we assessed are occurring within these habitats, kelp, sea, sea grasses, and so forth but the expected risk is relatively low for all of them. Whereas if we look at something like habitat forming marine invertebrates, corals and sponges, in particular, you can see that there are also four different fisheries occurring in these habitats, but uh, some of them pose a relatively higher risk than others, halibut, trawl, fishery, compared to the kelp bass sport hook and line. Okay, so that was the, the meat of the risk assessment Results, as I said at the top of the talk, uh, the outcome of the risk assessment in terms of the relative rankings of these different fisheries for their risk to target bycatch and habitat is uh, part of the, the outcome of this whole effort, but as important as sort of the lessons we learned about how to uh, develop science in a way that could actually inform management and policy. And so uh, I'd like to take this as a, as a chance to talk about the opportunities we had to interact directly with our partners, that's the project team, plus the California Department of Fish and Wildlife experts, uh, as well as um, with commercial and recreational fishermen. And so um, let me just pause for a second real quick and ask Aaron if, we are at the point where you were going to present some of these slides because I see that we don't have slide numbers, so I don't know where I am. No, you're good. Keep going. I'm good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and so we held two workshops, one in Long Beach, California, in the southern part of the state, and one in Santa Rosa, in the central, the northern part of the state. And the idea of these workshops was to show early versions of the ecological risk assessment framework we had developed, the pilot fisheries we'd selected, and the general approach in terms of exposure and sensitivity attributes to these groups, and then solicit feedback and input about the extent to which the way we were approaching the question of how much risk do each of these fisheries pose to the ecosystem, whether that resonated or not. And this is where there was a strong role for Strategic Earth, and I promise I'm not on their payroll, but I just want, I cannot emphasize enough the magic that occurred when there was somebody that was not me from NOAA, not Aaron from California Ocean Science Trust, not somebody from CDFW at the front of the room talking us through what the, the initial results looked like and how we might modify them. It really helped to get that kind of input and it allowed us to do things um, that we couldn't have done otherwise. And so this sort of just reiterates a little bit about what the project team looked like, um, who attended these workshops, which included both the sport and commercial fishery sectors, representatives from environmental NGOs, scientists, academics that provided input. And perhaps as importantly, this is part of the legislation of the Marine Life Management Act is to engage and partner with stakeholders. And so this is just two quick examples of how we had some of the attributes in the risk assessment that we described one way originally and then changed uh, based on input. And so originally we had an attribute like the life stage of the species, target species bycatch or habitat that was affected by the fishery. And we were suggesting that risk was going to be higher if the fishery affected individuals before they had the opportunity to reproduce, and that would likely inhibit recovery. So this was a sensitivity attribute, and it's in line with some of the work that's been done previously in productivity susceptibility analyses and, and other risk assessments. But we ended up removing this attribute from the target and bycatch uh, risk assessment um, not because uh, we didn't think the precedence was important, but it just didn't have support from the stakeholders or from the state managers for including it. And in the end, um, removing it didn't weaken the overall risk assessment in our estimation. 
and to some extent didn't change the outcome because there are a number of different attributes. And so um, the, the, those are, that's one concrete example of how we took feedback from those workshops and modified the framework for ecological risk assessment. Another is that we change the weightings of different attributes to reflect the consensus among this group of stakeholders on which attributes created the greatest risk. As a simple example, there was lots of conversation around the release mortality associated with bycatch. Basically, if you're fishing for kelp bass on a hook and line, you catch a rockfish by mistake and you throw it back, if it's a shallow living rockfish, chances are it's gonna be fine if you get it off the hook right away. And so they wanted those sorts of considerations factored into the risk assessment. And so what, what we were able to do via these workshops is uh, get unstuck from some points that were rather contentious. This is a slide here from a, a paper around translational ecology that came out around the time we were doing this and just really resonated with us as what I might have done had Aaron not found me and I'd learned that there was a need for an ecological risk assessment. And what we ended up doing, which was working in a collaborative way to develop trust and understanding with the people that were going to use and be affected by the risk assessment tool so that it could be put into practice for determining how to prioritize fisheries for additional management interventions in California. So uh, that brings us to back to the top of the three lessons from applying this ecological risk assessment framework. Hopefully we've covered what the policy window was in terms of the amendment to the Marine Life Management Act's master plan in California. The kind of risk assessment we did on a very short timeline to provide information in a pilot study for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and stakeholders, and then how we were able to do that via holding stakeholder workshops and working uh, at, across uh, a number of different types of expertise in a transdisciplinary kind of way. And I think if I remember right, this is where I hand back to Erin the microphone, but I'll control the slides and she'll tell us a little bit about where California is at this point. Wonderful. Um, so where are we? Great question. Um, where we're at is last year, uh, the Marine Life Management Act master plan update was adopted by the Fish and Game Commission. And the ecological risk assessment tool we just talked about was included as the main method for pri prioritizing, um, especially for prioritizing against bycatch and habitat. Um, so that left the department, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, with the job of um, starting to implement their new master plan and setting off to create their prioritized list. They are going to be um, presenting their prioritized list in their methods um, to the Fish and Game Commission for adoption this winter. Um, and while they're definitely using it, where it does seem like they're thinking about how much of this ERA they can incorporate into the initial prioritization versus saving for later for a deeper dive into it, each fishery. So we're kind of in a, a state change moment to see, see where they, they take this and where, where this journey takes them. Um, can you go to the next slide, Jamil? Um, so where does that leave the collective we, the collective us? Um, from where, from where I sit, um, I think that these are, are my reflections. Um, taking in multiple types of knowledge and feedback mattered. It changed our thinking, it changed the tool in positive ways, um, and it mattered to the fishermen and the NGOs um, and, and other stakeholders in the room that we, uh, there was definitely a learning curve for all of us of sharing something before it's prime time and showing all of your all of your work kind of midway, but they definitely recognized that and felt included and could, could actually see changes being made um, based on their feedback. We also were able to make changes even in the scoring just based on fishermen's knowledge of being out on the water and how their gear works and what they're doing. Um, we accomplished our goal, um, and in my opinion, <laughs> we created a repeatable transparent tool 
all of the R code uh, that Jamil and Joe made is online. The scoring spreadsheets and the instructions on how to do this are online. Um, we published an open access paper um, that was peer reviewed. And then we also made another report that's more for general audiences that kind of tells the story, but also shares uh, information about the pilot project. I think another thing that we accomplished um, that was a goal of this project was to create a tool that has the foundation and scaffolding needed to be adapted and applied elsewhere. Uh, it can be updated to include other stressors. Um, remember, we started with this multi-stressor tool for a reason, not just to be able to um, upscale out of just target species to bycatch and habitat, but making something that folks could adapt to their habitats and their fisheries, but something that there are other stressors that are important to them um, for assessing relative risk. I think that this tool is a great place to start if you want to start to think about things like ocean acidification or temperature increases, uh, pollution, hab events. Um, and, and the jury is still out, quite frankly, on how or if um, this ERA is being used um, in its initial intended application. And, and that's okay. Um, that's why we do pilots, right? That's why we try new things to see if a new way of doing things takes us in a different direction than we've been in the past. And I think it definitely did. Um, we're just figuring out how the story ends um, for California. But I do think that this tool, part of the, what is exciting to me personally about this tool is we, we chose um, the initial tool to adapt because of its flexibility. And I think that we left that piece alone, that it is very flexible to be picked up and have the same thing happen elsewhere. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Jamil. Thanks, Aaron. I think you've covered most of it. And so I will wrap us up relatively quickly here just by emphasizing a couple of my own reflections, which is one, um, I hope no one takes away from this that we think we arrived at the best possible answer or any sense of absolute risk. What we did was in a transparent way that incorporated the knowledge and preferences of stakeholders as well, including scientists, um, developed a way to assess risk to the ecosystem from fisheries in California. And this could be improved in a variety of different ways. And because we've laid bare the approach we used and the scores that were included and the attributes that were included and the weightings of each of those attributes for exposure and sensitivity, it could be improved upon and modified and it's modular. So for instance, you could say, I only care about three attributes for exposure and three for sensitivity, and I don't wanna know about habitat. You could come up with a risk assessment with that and it'd just be about setting some parameters to zero in the code that's available online. Um, alternatively, uh, you could decide that the 10 bycatch groups that we selected are not the ones that are of concern to the department at the moment, but rather we'd like to split out something like non-pelagic fin fish into a number of different subgroups and assess for spare that would clearly influence the bycatch risk score. And so all those things are possible to do. I think something that was really helpful as we were working through this at the stakeholder workshops was recognizing that this is a screening tool to identify potential concerns, potential fisheries that are posing a higher risk to the ecosystem. And what we wanted to do was avoid false negatives where you'd say, oh, there's no risk from that fishery to uh, habitats or bycatch, and then realize down the line that you'd neglected some important considerations. And so this, um, it's quite different than saying, okay, we flagged this as a potentially high risk. Is it really? That's a second step that has been articulated nicely by our first by our Australian colleagues uh, in the context of doing a you know level one qualitative risk assessment versus level two semi-quantitative and level three quantitative risk assessments. So uh, I think if I could leave you with that idea that this is a potentially promising screening tool that could be used across different scales from local, regional, state to federal levels for determining which fisheries or other ocean-based activities are posing risk to different components of the ecosystem. I think we could be in a great place. If I left you with just that though, you'd miss part of the point, which is doing it alone in my office wouldn't have gotten us nearly as far
as developing this team that could leverage resources across different agencies institution, and institutions, along with a range of different expertise to arrive at the product we have now. Thanks very much, and if Peg says so, we'll take any questions. Yes, thank you, um, Aaron and Jamil. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Uh, there are their uh, email addresses if folks want to follow up with them separately, but we do have some time for questions. Let me turn to folks here in the room. Are there any questions? Do we have anything for either? Yes, uh, Stephanie Oaks, and we can just hand you the microphone so you can don't have to repeat it for you. I guess I was wondering um, if co-developing the risk assessment um, with the stakeholders improved their understanding of the outcome and what risk actually or relative risk actually meant in terms of understanding the outputs of the graphics or even like the the thermometer uh, gauges you, sh you showed. Yeah, Aaron or Jamil? Either or. Sure. Either. Either. Okay, great. Uh, how about both? Um, hi, Stephanie. Thanks for that question. It's a great hi. one. I will buy a little time for Erin because I'm going to make her answer the harder part of that question. One thing I, I would say quickly, though, is I learned a lot from the fishermen about what really matters in terms of what they see on the water um, posing risk. And it wasn't like they were shy about saying when certain types of weather or activities were to, you know, causing problems for non-target species. They, they, they would help us to understand that a bit more and also to understand when we were getting some things wrong. So um, I think you know the, the bi-directional learning piece is a really important thing to emphasize here. Aaron, what would you say about the extent to which uh, working through things in the workshop setting helped with some aha moments? Yeah, I think it's a big yes. Um, I'm acknowledging that I'm answering on um, the fishermen and the stakeholders behalf. Uh, we spent these workshops, we spent a lot of time talking about risk assessments in general and what they do and what the results can or can't mean before we dove into the nuts and bolts. Um, and that being said, I think that it it definitely was a primer for everyone in the room of what we were talking about. And I, I hope that what it's done is um, as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is continuing on their journey for implementing this prioritization that we've empowered them with knowledge to understand what the department is doing and how they arrived at these things and uh, these results that they have down the road and, and ask really good questions. Okay, thank you both. Um, we do have a couple questions online. And the first one is, um, how does climate change fit into this approach? Short answer is it doesn't, and then I would put a dot, dot, dot yet, uh, but it could. One way I've thought about that, and Aaron, I think you could add some, some texture here, um, in our discussions has been uh, in terms of thinking about risk to the ecosystem associated with a fishery, relative to the risk posed by climate change. And so one could imagine something like a climate vulnerability assessment score for a target stock being plotted against an ecosystem risk assessment score for that stock and saying, oh, okay, here's a stock that is both at risk from climate change and at high risk from fishing activities. That's and not in the legal sense, but a double jeopardy sort of situation that w warrants more attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that the, the door is open to figure out how to incorporate that. Um, and it's definitely something we've spent time thinking about. We just didn't have time or the bandwidth um, to do it, to do it here. But I would love to see someone think about that in the future. Okay, great. Thanks. Anyone else here in the library? No. Okay, no no more questions uh, here. Uh, I think we do have an inquiry online asking for a link to, I'm sorry, okay, the R code. And perhaps uh, we can give you, uh, we'll give you the uh, email address for that uh, request, um, Jamil and Aaron. 
Sure thing. Yes, and, and just an FYI to all our attendees, um, all these presentations are archived at the NOAA Library um, EBM series. So you can find them at the NOAA Library website, uh, all the past presentations as well as this one. And this will probably be posted within uh, 48 hours or so at, at the latest. Um, and if you have uh, colleagues that were unable to join us, uh, you might want to send them the link to this um, and, and be able to uh, uh, listen to Jamil and Aaron online. I think that's about it. Oh, two more questions. Hold on. Sorry, two questions just popped up. Um, so first one, assuming that different stakeholders have a different set of factors that they consider most important in either exposure or sensitivity, how did you account for that? Uh, for example, did you use some weighted fact, uh, weighting of these different factors in the overall assessment? I'm gonna let you answer that, Jamil. Okay, sure. Uh, that's a really interesting idea. We did not elicit scores from stakeholders beyond the California Department of Fish and Wildlife experts for the analysis itself. We did ask for reactions to scorings but and for information around those reactions, but we didn't explicitly do that. I think it would be really interesting uh, to consider that kind of approach in future exercises, um, especially if there is a lot of disagreement because it might help the, the California DFW in this case hone in on, well, what's the most contentious piece of this? And is there a way we can inform that with uh, the, the right answer with um, scientific evidence? Or if there's not a quote unquote right answer, then at least acknowledge the multiple different perspectives on the issue. Okay, great, thank you. We do have uh, two more questions. In addition to scientists, fishers, and uh, the government, how did you include consumers? That's a great question. Um, for this pilot project, we, we did not include consumers specifically or, or even ports. Um, it's kind of that trade-off of time, capacity, um, and and making the, those those trade-offs, but I think that it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing to do in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, why not include risk to, to trophic chain or communities rather than a species focus? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand that question, but I will say that we shaped the focal components of the risk assessment based on the interpretation of what was required under the Marine Life Management Act in California by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so we were really trying to do something that they felt they could use and apply for their fisheries. And if I remember right, and this is going back a while, Erin, there were, was discussion of thinking about things like risk to diversity or risk to other community or ecosystem level indicators. And my short version summary of that is that that felt a little too abstracted from on the ground visible things that fishermen and others experience on an everyday basis. And so that was of less interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, great thing. We have room for uh, one more question. Um, what was the reaction um, of the Office of Protected Resources towards the risk of T and E bycatch? Good question. I'm not sure about their specific reactions, um, but I can talk about bycatch more generally and just that in our workshops and our conversations um, with other scientists and with uh, the department, that is definitely a sticking point. Um, I think that we arrived at a good spot for this pilot about how we were incorporating them and thinking about them um, and weighting them in, in this 
this context, um, but it's definitely something that we acknowledged throughout, at least in California, um, the way that you define bycatch can be can be different and in California is a little bit, um, I think in flux in terms of thinking about how they want to address it and define it. Um, and so we kind of made the choice in this pilot of how we were gonna address it because you know we had to get done in a year, um, but the door is open to being able to define bycatch differently, to be able to address bycatch differently, depending on what um, the, the way that you think about it and the way you define it and prioritize it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamil and Aaron. Great job, um, excellent presentation. We had a, a lot of attendance there online and appreciate all those questions. Um, our next presentation is again, uh, the second Wednesday of the month, November 13th, and it's the same time. And it will be Elliot Hazen from our Southwest Fishery Science Center. The title of his talk is Dynamic Ocean Management Approaches to Preserve Protected Species. So please join us uh, in a month. And again, thanks again to everyone who joined us today and uh, look forward to your comments. You certainly can provide comments online to us about future presentations and uh, we'd be happy to take those. Thanks again and take care.